Alright guys, Bill, I'm here back with a new video, and in this video, I'm back with another Survivor Top 10 Player Ranking. This one being a bit different, as I've never done a ranking of players based on the style of edit that they got. Though I did find this to be kind of an interesting concept, and here I'll be ranking the Top 10 players that got a purple edit. Now, obviously, if you don't know what purple means, it is a term coined from Purple Kelly from Survivor Nicaragua, where she got a very notable quiet edit to where from that point forward, the term purple in the reality TV sphere is typically given to a person who is not prominent in the edit. So this list will be ranking the top 10 players that got quiet edits. Now, the question is, how do they quantify this? And obviously the easiest way to quantify screen time is confessional counts. While it isn't necessarily a one for one, I do feel like that's the easiest thing to base things off of here. And essentially the requirement I decided to make for this list is that a person must have an average confessional count across a season of less than one, which I was actually surprised that there were as many people that fit into this category as there were, as there turned out to be 41 players that qualified for this list to where initially i was thinking i might have to bump it up to 1.25 or 1.5 but again there were just so many people with less than one that made this list pretty easy to put together with there actually being like some decent enough players on this list surprisingly so again we will be ranking the top 10 however i do have honorable mentions to run through now we're going to be splitting this up into two different types of honorable mentions honorable mentions in terms of people that did not qualify as a purple edit under my standard here but would have been on the list had they been eligible and then the other people are people that were eligible but just did not actually crack the top 10. So for the people that weren't eligible here I'm going to start off with Becky from Cook Islands who again like I've always thought of Becky as like a solid player like I do think a lot of decision making between her and Yule like I do think while yes yeah, she did make a lot of moves in the game that were more beneficial towards Yule than to her and she definitely lacked in terms of managing her jury perception I do think as a whole she didn't play a bad game and she definitely would have been relatively high on this list but again she just barely being above the average though she didn't qualify also another one that would have been on the list is Natalie Bolton who again like while I don't know what the end game path is for Natalie Bolton especially to win the game like she did make some pretty impressive moves along the way obviously playing with the Black Widow Brigade and she also got a near purple edit until the very end like she's kind of one of these weird circumstances where she's almost not even on the show until the last few episodes but then she really really peaks in those last few episodes but again it ended up barely being above the average that was needed for this list also the only winner that's even going to be mentioned in this video is natalie white who again barely had over a one average where obviously she would have been on the list as well though didn't make it on next up is someone tied for the lowest average of a finalist and that is natalie Tanarelli, who i mean like wasn't really that that close but again for a finalist to get a literal average confessional count of one is pretty notable there so again i think she would have been consideration also from redemption island i would have considered grant again i don't know if he would have made the list but i do think he's like a fine player but he just barely had over a one average brenda from kara moen would have also been consideration though again I, I never really saw brenda playing that great of a game in caramoan where probably not which i should also say that again like when it comes to returning seasons i did decide to just base it off how they played on that individual season instead of how they are as actual players in the grand scheme of things but again brenda didn't make it on also troyzan was not in consideration as he also had a one average in game changers so again he might have been consideration but didn't make it and the final person to mention here is the most recent person to even mention here and that person is heather from survivor 41 who also had a one average and again maybe would have been on the list but again did not quite hit the requirements so again those are people that didn't qualify for the list now let's talk about the people that just legitimately didn't make it on and here we're going in chronological order starting off with kind of a random pick here i believe the only pre-merge boot that we're going to be mentioning in this video and that person is jackie from survivor gabon who has always stood out to me as one of the better pre-merge boots as someone that was really just swap screwed in a position where she was really solid with the people that end up running the other side she just got separated from them gets kind of screwed over due to that Again, really just bad luck, but again, not enough to really qualify as the top 10 here. 
from Survivor Nicaragua. These people weren't really in consideration, though I did feel the need to at least mention them. That being Dan Lembo, who, again, like I don't think of Dan Lembo as that great of a player, but he did at least make the end game in a position where he would have won if he got to the end. He was only two votes away from that. So, again, that counts for something, but I just don't think he did much well to actually get to that point. And the other person is obviously the titular Purple Kelly. However, again, Purple Kelly's not that great of a player even though again she obviously had a lot of disadvantages towards her i mean while people will obviously criticize her quit i do think it is kind of justified for the fact that they just didn't give her any clothes to wear but again still not a great survivor player next up i mean might as well talk about them at once we do have keith and whitney from survivor south pacific both of which finally getting purpled in their season both of which kind of playing similar games obviously keith gets booed earlier but really before that they were just essentially playing together playing similar games having an allegiance to jim rice also having an allegiance to ozzy kind of playing the middle though at the merge obviously just get outnumbered like they're both fine but again did not make the top 10 now from philippines i did also consider carter and carter was someone i greatly considered for this list to where he really just barely doesn't make it on and the reason he doesn't make it on for me is because one again he was like three rounds away from the end where like if he got to the end would he have won probably especially if he's against like alisa scoopin and abby maria like, i think malcolm and denise probably still both beat him but even then i don't know what his plan was like i don't think he really had much of a game at that point i think he was just on the bottom and really just throughout a lot of the post merge he was kind of just like going in and out of the majority and kind of just sticking around like i mean it's not bad for sure but really on this list he kind of like hovers right outside the top 10 also i did consider artists from philippines which again wasn't really that that close to making the list but at least he was in the majority alliance for a lot of his season though still pretty faulty player especially like how much he burned his relationship with scooping so and wasn't too high next person here another person that was like hovering in the top 10 barely didn't make it, and that person's west nail from san juan del sur who i very much considered largely from the fact that he gets voted out here in a double idol play which was kind of a wonky circumstance there and he was technically part of a plan that was so close to coming through blindsiding john mish However, the main reason he's not on the top 10 for me is the fact that I think he was pretty much dead man walking after that anyway. Like, well, yes, I could qualify this as an idol play to where it would kind of elevate him a bit, especially in a ranking like amongst people in the same placement as him. But I think in the grander scheme of things, he was just going to be voted out in the next like couple rounds anyway. Like, it doesn't really change that much. I don't really see much potential in Wes as a player, though he's not the worst player in the world. And again, he definitely would have been close to cracking the top 10, but didn't make it. Next up from Cambodia, I did consider Kelly Wigglesworth, who uh, was someone that was like largely in the bottom for a lot of her season, but like still was able to like squeeze her way into some pretty integral relationships with like savage and joe that got her out of the minority at points but like at the end of the day not the greatest game in the world still didn't make the cut another person barely didn't make the cut this person's probably just number 11 on the list and that person is sunday from Lancer gen x where again i very much consider sunday i think my issue there is again that person that's like kind of hovering in and out of the majority at points particularly in that end game where she gets blindsided at the chris vote she ends up winning out in the rock draw only for him to be on the bottom again after the zeke vote only for the then vote out will only for her to then be blindsided herself because she's kind of like in and out of the majority like every other round in the post merge and then even the pre-merge like she's pretty well positioned on the original gen x tribe though after that her game's like a little bit more rocky with her flipping on jessica and her having this big rivalry with jessica only for david to keep jessica around like i don't know it's just kind of a mixed game to where again she just barely didn't make it now for game changers i did consider ozzy and again this would have been solely based on his game changers game but it's one where again like he was in the majority for a lot of it but really gets sniped at the beginning of the merge and really for me i just decided like he just gets booted too early like i think if he made it, like a few more rounds i think maybe i can make the argument but like considering he was literally booted at the second tribal after the merge like i just feel like his game didn't have much runway there to where he didn't make it on and so from ghost island someone i considered was sebastian who again was not a great player however he did make it pretty far into the game in a position where like he probably wins under certain scenarios if he's at the end against like angela and maybe like a donathan but like is that super likely not really and, and really i just don't think of him as the greatest player so while he didn't make it very far he didn't make it onto the list also on edge of extinction i did consider julia who despite julia kind of blowing up her game at the last second i do feel like most of her game up to that point was actually pretty solid and she's pretty solidly within the common majority for a lot of the season she's part of the joe and eric votes like she's a pretty integral player in the game but then again she kind of blows up her game and it's kind of a similar situation of 
She just booted so early in the merge in a pretty avoidable situation. I feel like I couldn't quite squeeze her on the list. And the last person to be an honorable mention here is from Winners at War, and that person is Wendell. And again, Wendell's in our situation. Like, was the merge boot? So because of that, he's pretty far off from the end game and didn't really have that much of a path moving forward in the game. But I did think his pre-merge is like solid. Like while his treatment of poverty and Michelle wasn't great at points, like I think as a whole, he remained in the majority for a lot of it. And it's not an entirely bad game, but again, didn't quite make the list. But with that, we're now at the top 10, the top 10 players to get a purple edit, top 10 players to get an average confessional count of less than one on a season. And we're starting that off with someone from a season that's represented twice on this list. One of two seasons that are represented twice on this list. Now we're starting it off with Michelle Yi from Survivor Fiji. And again, Michelle was kind of fighting with a spot with the likes of a Sunday, a Wes, a Carter. However, I decided to put Michelle on the list largely because, again, she does get largely screwed by the twist. Now, at the end of the day, it's not anything too, too different from a tribe swap outside of the fact that they weren't given time to deliberate at camp after the swap tribes were decided, but she still does get pretty screwed over there being put in a group where the majority is the opposite starting tribe also a group of the opposite starting tribe and through that it's just kind of an easy pick off there Though even then she had some outs she had dreams wavering between both sides and really it's like michelle played a fine game like realistically i don't look at michelle as that great of a player like if she were to play again i wouldn't expect it to go well for her however i think a major thing that boosts her on this list is the fact that again she was screwed over but also in a situation where all of her allies got to the end like her closest allies were earl and yao man who are literally two of the final four with earl ozzy ending up winning the game so i do feel like if michelle were to survive this round she had a lot of end game prospects however i think at the end of the day it's like she wouldn't have won if she got to the end like i don't think she beats either earl or yao man which is a main issue there but i do think her game as a whole was one really based around how screwed over she was and because that for me she's here number 10 now number nine moving on to a player that i don't think played that well actively though was well positioned for a lot of the game and got to the end game with win equity and that person is rick from survivor south pacific and again I don't think Rick did much in the game. It's like he aligned with the majority on the original Polu tribe. He was with Sophie, Albert, Coach, and Brandon. They ran the game. Again, do I think he was that integral to how they ran the game? No. I don't. Do I think Rick positioned himself well at all? No, I don't. But he still makes final five in the position if he gets to the end against anyone but Ozzy, I think he wins. So at least there's that. And again, really, it's like for me, Rick and Dan Lembo are pretty similar. However, the main reason why Rick is higher is because again, Rick was in the majority the entire time. Dan Lembo wasn't even in the majority the entire time. So I feel like that's something to at least credit with Rick. But as a whole, again, do I think of him as a grace player? Not really. But again, had win equity and was in the majority. So that's enough to be here at number nine now number eight we're moving on to the first returnee we're going to be talking about on the board this being a person that essentially ran a lot of the game with her allies however those allies just got all the screen time over her and at number eight we do have danielle de lorenzo from survivor heroes versus villains and again danielle plays a solid game i mean really her game and party's game are mostly the same they really worked in lockstep together obviously danielle didn't have the target on her back that poverty did and poverty obviously has a individual move that sticks out more so in the double idol play that danielle wasn't as involved in but it's like danielle still plays a solid game for a lot of it i think the issues again i don't think she was respected i don't know if she wins a jury vote like i think if they did get to the poverty danielle russell final three probably poverty ends up winning that one as danielle wasn't really respected out there though Again, I think if there was a Danielle Candace Russell final three, maybe there's a chance. But really, it's like, again, like, I don't know if Danielle had any winning prospects, which is the issue. But again, she was alongside Russell and Poverty as they ran the game. She was working in lockstep with Poverty throughout a lot of the game. And really, she gets booted in her boot round, seemingly due to just Russell being jealous and wanting Poverty to himself. Which again, you can say that Danielle misplayed that for sure, but I do think it's also this kind of wonky circumstance of her playing with a player as emotional, but also as strategically dominating as Russell, which is not a common occurrence. So I do think Danielle, again, like I don't think she played a great game in the grand scheme of things. Again, not really much win equity. Gets taken out. Still, what, three more rounds till the end? But I do think a lot of her game is 
just very similar to that of Parvati and Russell's, just with a little bit less agency than them, but still good enough to be here number eight. Now, number seven, we're moving on to the other player from Survivor Fiji on the list here, and that person is Stacy. And Stacy is a player that, again, kind of similar to Danielle. Like, I don't know if she had any win equity. I don't know if Stacy wins if she gets to the end. Like, I assume she doesn't over Earl or Yao Man. However, I do think in most other situations, she probably does have the votes of like Alex and Edgardo. And it's like, you never really know, but like, she's not someone I'm looking at as like that likely of a winner. But also, she is someone that's idled out. In her round. Mind you, she also makes the mistake of openly alerting Yao Man to playing the idol, which causes him to idol her out of the game, which is dumb. But again, she is technically voted out in a position where she does have the majority on her side. And before that, I mean, she was an initial majority on Moto. Mind you, she did treat the people in the minority really terribly, but she was at least in the numbers there. She's able to remain in the majority really throughout most of the post merge. But obviously, once the four horsemen are out, she's next on the pecking order. But even then, like, almost survives that round. So again, like, it's not all bad. Though I do think it's the fact that she gets either out of the game that really ends up placing her higher than the last few people we talked about here at number seven. Now, number six, we're moving on to two people in a row here that get very similar edits, but also very similar placements. And through that, have also pretty similar games. And at number six, we're starting it off with the earliest player on the board here. And that person is Dara from Pearl Islands. And and Dara to me, again, like I think has a solid game here. One that if she gets to the end, I think she probably wins. She's only two rounds away from that. Two immunity wins in a position where she had been winning a lot of immunities beforehand. And also a situation where like I think people think of her as being screwed over by the jury being able to play in the immunity challenge. Now, in reality, I don't think that actually is the case, as even if the entire challenge was just relegated to the players themselves, Johnny Fairplay was in the lead to where he would have won that anyway over Dara. And also, Dara did seem to seal her own fate through a fight with Lil, to where initially it did seem like the women were actually going to stick together until Fairplay got her and Lil to start arguing, and that's pretty bad from Dara. But again, she's like pretty safe throughout a lot of the early game. While she is pretty much at the bottom of the Morgan majority, she's still aligned with them, and like, again, I do think the likes of Savage and Rhino and Austin and Tawana were all closer to each other than they were to her, but she was still there. Though also, it's like, if they did go to another tribal, if it wasn't for the Austin situation, I do think Darrow probably would have been in trouble. But coming to the merge, again, kind of screwed over by the Outcast twist. Her side doesn't gain power there. And through that, she's in and out of the majority at points. Again, she's being brought into the Rupert vote, only for Tawana to be blindsided immediately after that. And then she's brought in on the Krista vote. And then she's part of the Burton vote, only to be taken out immediately afterwards. Again, like she's kind of just in and out of the majority. But again, she does get very close to the end in a position where she's very close to the win. And that's a lot of the reason why she's so high on the list here at number six. Now, number five, again, a very similar person. Or I feel like there's a couple more individual moves in my eyes that are better from this person. And that person is Jen from Survivor Palau. And again, Jen is a very similar thing. Again, purple edit, fourth placer, but also a person that had a decent amount of win equity. Now, I think Dara had more win equity. Dara, I think, for sure wins against anyone in that final four. While Jen, not the case, right? I think Jen for sure loses to Tom. Again, against Ian, I think it would have been probably kind of close. And I think she definitely beats Katie. So again, like the win equity like is there, but it's definitely less so than it is with Dara. However, I feel like there are more impressive individual moments with Jen particularly the final four round. In the round that she ends up going home, I do think she does very good work on trying to flip Tom against Ian, to which he ends up allowing her to go to fire. Mind she was never beating Ian in fire, but I do think the fact that she got to that point is pretty good. And really, before that, like, she's in the majority for most of the game. Unlike Dara, who's, like, in and out at points, and even then at the bottom, Jen was more so solidly positioned on the original Karor tribe. Again, she had Greg. She was close to Katie. She was, like, part of this majority with Tom and Ian. I do think an issue for her is the fact that she gets rid of people that were closer to her earlier on in the merge than they were to Tom and Ian, allowing them to take the numbers from them at the final six, where she gets blindsided with the Greg vote. But even then, she survives the Karen vote in a situation where, like, she had no reason to be surviving there. They 100% should have voted her out over Karen. And I think a lot of that is credited due to her relationship with Katie and with Ian. That was definitely better than that of Karen's. But again, I think it's her letting go of people like a Kobe and people like a Stephanie. These people that could have been numbers for her that caused the end of her game, but overall still a solid game. One with win equity by the end, one with decent moves here and there, one with a pretty solid position for a lot of the game. And because of that, for me, she's here at number 
five. Now, number four, we're moving on to a player that straight up, this person's placement is largely reliant on some post-game information. Now, we've heard that might not even be true, but based on what I've heard, I am putting Kelly Sharbaugh on the list from Survivor Samoa. And Kelly Sharbaugh is a player here that, again, is obviously booted earlier than the last few people we've talked about. I mean, she was literally second boot after the merge, 11th place. However, she was idled out of the game in a position where she was pretty solidly positioned on the original glue. Now, again, a lot of this information comes from Dave Ball, and again, don't know how reliable Dave Ball necessarily is, but according to him, the final four, the core alliance on glue was him, Kelly, Brett, and Laura, with him and Kelly essentially being a duo. Tor had Galoo not broken apart, that more than likely would have been a final four, with Kelly having an easy path to the end. Now, at the end of the day, do I think Kelly wins if she gets to the end? Probably not. I think she probably does lose to really any of the other three in a Brett, a Laura, a Dave, but she at least had a much easier path to the end based on the information that we have. I think when mixing that with the fact that, again, she was out of the game, essentially sniped out of the game in this position where if only Galoo had stuck together, then she would have at that point been alongside a majority alliance and probably actually getting to the end, essentially a better version of Jen's game. That is a lot of the reason why she's at number four here, where, like, again, like if we're talking about the game she played here, it is not that dissimilar from from Jen's or Dara's just the fact that she's consistently in the majority and just got sniped out by an idol play before she was able to fully execute on it so for me again like I feel like based on the information we have it's good enough to land her at number four now number three and here we're moving on to a player that, again like was barely on the show a pretty notorious purple edit in the modern day the one that I do think this person played pretty well for a lot of their season and just loses out on their eventual boot round and that person is Chelsea from Survivor Ghost Island and again Chelsea supposedly was a much better player than what we see in the show where she's barely on the show however she seemed to be a pretty central person in the original Navidi tribe where the stories that we've heard is there was potentially going to be a 5-5 split however Chelsea seemed to be the person that was more so in the middle not as fully loyal to the Chris Noble side of things and had connections to the other side to where she seemed to be pretty well positioned there. After the swap, she's also pretty well positioned where she does stick to her alliance, but is also another person that is like being courted to potentially flipping. And after that, she's one of the main orchestrators of the Bradley vote where her and Dominic end up throwing the challenge, the vote out Bradley before the merge. Then at the merge, she really just stays in the VD strong up until her boot round, the final eight, where there she finally decides to make her move and is almost successful in doing so or essentially at the end of the day it was her relying on Donathan and Laurel and she almost pulls off this coup on Wendell and Dominic though obviously isn't able to get Laurel on her side though even then Donathan wanted to flip and even then I think you can argue that the timing of the move was her essentially being screwed over by the split tribal twist where that just happened in the previous round where she missed on the opportunity to make these moves at the final 10 and final 9 when she would have potentially had more numbers to back her up and I think it's also a position where Chelsea seemed to actually be well liked out there and seemed to be well respected to where if Chelsea got to the end especially against like some of these not bigger names like a Dom and Wendell and probably not like a Kellen maybe but I think she wins in a lot of scenarios so I do think Chelsea is definitely an understated player in Survivor history one that again comes very close to pulling over this coup on Wendell and Dominic two of these more dominant players in Survivor history because that for me she's here at number three now number two we're moving on to the last returnee on the board here one that again similarly tried to make a big move ends up failing but this person had a much cleaner path to the end had she been successful in the move and more than likely wins and that person is Kimmy Kappenberg from Survivor Cambodia and yeah Kimmy was someone that I wasn't really expecting to be on this list coming into it I kind of forgot Kimmy got as few confessionals as she did especially considering like how big of a splash she goes out in though again like she ends up playing a pretty solid game here and she's in the majority for most of the game having these really solid allies and like a Steven and a Jeremy and while again there's points in the post merge she's in and out of the majority like that's really most of the people on Cambodia but really it's like again like obviously Savage gets idled out of the game I don't really knock that against her but Kelly Wigglesworth gets blindsided she's not looped in on that plan but also 
It's not really that damning to me, considering her allies decide to work with her immediately following that anyway. The final 10 round is one where she's technically on the bottom, though Jeremy ends up saving Steven with an idol. And the final 9 rounds kind of the opposite, where she's technically in the majority, though they end up messing up the split vote to where it causes Steven to be voted out. However, following that, again, like she's solidly back in the majority. She's working alongside the Jeremy Spencer Tasha side of things, while also still keeping her relationships with someone like a Kelly Wentworth and a Keith as they vote out Joe and Abby Maria and then she finally makes her move at final six almost pulling over a 3-2-1 move against Jeremy Collins only for him to decide to play his idol at the last second only for both Kelly and Jeremy to play their idols to which we get obviously the crazy no vote tribal where she's eventually taken out by default but again like from what we've heard post show is that the jury really respected the fact that she was the single mother and considering how most of the people on the jury were these older parents it did seem to really gain Kimmy a lot of favor with the jury to where it does feel like Kimmy would have probably won if she got to the end mind you again like if it's against Wentworth I think it's probably her biggest competition there but it did seem like a decent amount of the jury was very pro Kimmy so that's a major aspect of of why I rate her so high here. Where again, Kimmy's only a few rounds away from almost for surely winning the game. And while I don't think she's the most active player in the world beforehand to actually get herself into this position where she's able to potentially pull off this 3 2 1, the fact that she's able to orchestrate this move and it to only fall apart at the last second is impressive enough for me that mixing that in for win equity, it does leave her number two. Now, number one, the best purple player in Survivor history ends up being the closest person to winning the game that's eligible for this list. And that person is Brett Closer from Survivor Samoa. And again, like this wasn't really close for me, really. Like, I feel like Brett was by far number one here, where like obviously one thing is that he's one immunity challenge away from winning the game in probably a unanimous vote. Maybe just one vote not going his way, but like the majority of the jury was so pro Brett to where he was so close to winning the game. However, in this situation, obviously we're taking into account the fact that he had to win out, was out of the majority for a lot of that mid-merge phase of the game, and again, would have gone home if he didn't win certain challenges however that's also all due to the fact that russell plays like successfully and ended up completely flipping the game in a really unprecedented way where again like i think most scenarios the season plays out glue is able to hold the numbers post merge and if we're looking at the situation where glue hold the numbers brett is in a very strong position I and mean, brett was pretty perfectly positioned on the original glue tribe really being in the center of most things i mean he was aligned with the guys that were seeming to form with like eric cardona and John Fincher. He also had a close relationship to a lot of the girls and Laura and Kelly and Monica. However, also he was supposedly part of this Dave Ball alliance of Dave Ball, Laura, Brett, and Kelly. Was supposedly the plan was for them to be the top four with Laura and Dave Ball facing off in fire in the final round, which means that Brett is essentially guaranteed final three in a position where, while yes, you can probably debate the fact that like at that point would even be looked at that highly if he doesn't have this underdog story and everything. He's still an extremely likable person that was good at building social bonds to where it would not shock me if he ends up winning in that final three so again like i think if we're looking at this other scenario of how the season could have played out i think he's in a very very good spot in that scenario and even in the bad scenario this is essentially the worst case scenario for brett's game he still ends up being only one immunity challenge away from winning the game so again i think as a whole i do think of brett's game here as a pretty solid one where again i think we're like just purely assessing how the season played out again i will knock him for the fact that he didn't need to win out for the fact that he was outplayed by russell hans and was on the bottom for a lot of the mid merge however i think if we look at it from a more broader sense i do think most time brett plays he does very well and i do think the way this season played out felt like an anomaly to where most other times the season plays out i do think his side ends up controlling the numbers with him being very solidly positioned within the grouping so i think as a whole again, i do look at brett's game pretty highly especially in comparison to the rest of the people on this list here because that he's here number one but there we go i mean that's my top 10 players to get a purple edit now, obviously moving forward i'll continue to do similar style of videos for survivor big brother other reality shows but for now that's the video thank you for watching